Hi, I'm Greg Grant, Smith County Horticulturist for the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service here in Tyler, Texas. And I'm joining you today, or tonight for that matter, uh, to talk to you about the bulbs that will be available in the Smith County Master Gardeners Earth Kind Bulbs to Bloom Conference and Sale. So this is the 2022 list of the bulbs that will be available uh, in the Smith County Master Gardeners Annual Fall Sale. If you know me, you know that I love flower bulbs, and I essentially always have loved flower bulbs. Uh, I can remember five years old, standing at the top of the stage at Peggy Ann Kindergarten in Longview, Texas with my sister, uh, thinking about my field of tulips and the bulb farm uh, that I was eventually planning on owning. Uh, of course, tulips don't do so well here, and that didn't work out. Uh, but out, thankfully for me and for lots of other people, and gardeners in Texas in the south. There are spring flower bulbs that do extremely well here. But it's very important that you do your homework, that you test, that you trial, that you read the proper books, that you watch the proper lectures and television shows because the majority of the bulbs that they grow in the, uh, in the world, particularly those that are produced in Holland, don't do well in Texas and the south. As a matter of fact, the general rule is if a bulb grows well in Texas, it's not gonna grow well in Holland. And if it grows well in Holland, it's not going to grow well in Texas. If you choose your bulbs properly, there are bulbs that will not only get better year after year, multiply year after year, make more blooms year after year, uh, but won't need to be divided, won't need to be watered, won't need to be sprayed, and will even outlive you and possibly even your home. So that uh, sounds like it's not possible, but I can assure you from a lifetime, lifetime of studying bulbs, my mentor, Dr. William C. Welch, always liked to talk about plants that were, quote, time tested. So in other words, if they've gone through years and decades and centuries, and there are some plants that have been around literally for thousands of years, those are what we call time tested plants. So in other words, we know they're going to grow well because time has proven to us that they do grow well. Now, something that the Smith County Master Gardeners and myself do that very few people in the country do, particularly at sales like this, or that we only sell those bulbs that we've tested and trialed. So we maintain an earth kind bulb trial. We only put plants in the sale uh, that have performed well for at least three years. And I don't mean just perform well, but get better year after year. And so much better if we know them for 10 years or 20 years or a lot of the plants that I've grown now, uh, I've grown for half a century. And so the longer you grow them, the more you know about them. And so we don't put any plants in the sale that we haven't trialed and evaluated ourselves. So you'll hear me refer to the term earth kind. Uh, the earth kind so concept was something that Texas a and AgriLife came up with to designate those plants that would grow well without water and fertilizer and pesticides. So that's the kind of bulbs that we're gonna to talk to you about today. So when I'm talking about earth kind bulbs, I'm referring to bulbs that are long lived perennials don't require chilling. If you plant a bulb that requires chilling in your refrigerator, it automatically tells you that it comes from a different climate and it's not gonna perform well as a perennial here. We want bulbs that require no irrigation. Uh, the bulbs that do best in Texas are those that work on a wet dry cycle, unlike those in Holland that work on a warm cold cycle. We want bulbs that require no fertilizer, no pesticides, and don't need to be divided to keep them blooming. So it sounds like an extremely tall order, but once again, I can assure you from a lifetime experience, there are bulbs that fit these criteria. Our goal is actually to educate you about bulbs. So even though the Smith County Master Gardeners have this fundraiser each year to raise funds, to carry on educational programs here in Smith County, and to maintain the Tyler Botanical Garden, our main goal is to teach you about plants you don't require a lot of care. They come back year after year and reward you with blooms for hopefully longer than even you live. So just a little bit of education on bulbs. First of all, bulbs are herbaceous plants with a fleshy underground storage organ made up of modified leaves. Think about an onion. Uh, those onion rings that you slice up are actually modified leaves. Uh, these include both annual and perennial types. We're only gonna talk about perennial types today. Good examples of perennial bulbs for the South would be daffodils, amaryllis, and lilies. Uh, we often loosely use the term bulbs to include other type of storage organs, including tubers, uh, caladiums, corms, which would be gladiolus, rhizomes, which are what iris have, and tuberous roots, uh, and daylilies would be an example there. So those are some other plants that have storage organs in their stems or their roots that we loosely refer to as bulbs. Annual bulbs are those bulbs that 
They're only useful for one season. In other words, they don't reliably return and bloom each year. Good examples would be tulips, Dutch hyacinths, and caladiums. Short-lived bulbs are those plants that only perform well for a few years and then gradually decline. Uh, some examples will be some of the large flowered daffodils, most true lilies, and most florist type gladiolus. Spring bulbs are those bulbs that bloom in the late winter and early spring. Uh, they grow foliage during the wintertime and spring, go dormant during the summertime. Uh, good examples will be jonquils, snowflakes, and narcissus. Summer bulbs are those bulbs that grow and bloom during the late spring and summer. Uh, most of these are somewhat subtropical in origin, go dormant during the wintertime when it's cold, and are somewhat tender and grow primarily outdoors only in the south, and not in the north and, and not in Europe. Good examples will be crinums, hymenicalis, and cannas. Fall bulbs uh, are those bulbs that bloom in the late winter and fall after a summer drought induced dormancy. They normally bloom without the foliage and grow foliage during the fall and winter. Uh, they do not want some irrigation. Matter of fact, you can foul up their blooms on them if you do irrigate during the summer. Good examples would be spider lilies, black like chorus, oxblood lilies, and rain lilies. Naturalizing is a term you'll hear in the bulb world, and that's when bulbs multiply and spread on their own from seed and seemingly grow wild. Uh, perennialize is another term that we use when those bulbs return each year as perennials. The clumps get bigger, uh, but may or may not naturalize. So in other words, the, the clumps get bigger and bigger, but they don't make any volunteer seedlings, so they don't spread across the landscape. Uh, there are very, very few bulbs that naturalize truly naturalize in Texas, and even the ones that do tend to do quite slowly. So sometimes we use the term naturalize uh, when we plant bulbs to make them look like they've naturalized, but really uh, they're just perennialized, or we've planted them to look like they're growing as wildflowers. And so there are a good many perennial bulbs that are sterile hybrids and set no seed that have no opportunity whatsoever to naturalize. Characteristics of bulbs in general would be that they're easy to grow, low maintenance, drought tolerant, light feeders, more expensive than other plants, long-lived and mostly propagated by division. Uh, I say more expensive uh, in the short term, but in the long term, the fact that they multiply profusely, uh, you can literally take one bulb and turn into hundreds of bulbs or hundreds of bulbs and turn them into thousands of bulbs during your lifetime. Soil requirements in general for bulbs, but not that particular about the soil. Good drainage is best for most of them. The annual types like tulips require an annual uh, soil mix or a potting soil, but we're not gonna grow those kind. Uh, you may, but I'm not. Uh, Tezatas and heirloom species tend to be the best for alkaline soils if you happen to be from Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, College Station, etc. Narcissus, uh, that's the group we're going to start with first. Uh, Narcissus is from Greek mythology. Uh, he's actually the son of Sisyphus and, and Liriope, like our ground cover. Uh, Narcissus belong to the Amaryllis family. Uh, they're primarily native to Europe. Uh, they tend to naturalize, uh, at least some of them do. The wild species do, can spread like a wildflower. As I mentioned, the ones that perennialize return and multiply in the clump, uh, but don't spread. And the botanical name Narcissus includes the common name uh, groups of what I'll refer to as daffodils, jonquils, and Narcissus in this talk. Daffodils all uh, descend from a species known as Narcissus pseudonarcissus. And so any of the offspring of Narcissus pseudonarcissus and those hybrids that still look like that particular species, we refer to as daffodils. They tend to have single flowers with a big cup in the middle, a little to no scent, mostly in yellows, a few whites and bicolors, and have wide blue-green foliage. Uh, daffodils are the most popular of all the Narcissus types. Unfortunately, the most popular daffodils of all are the great big yellow-flowered types. Um, sadly, there are no such things as great big large yellow daffodils in the wild, so most of these have been bred uh, as cut flowers and don't do well as long-term perennials. So they're mostly to be grown for short term or to be dug and divided, separated, fertilized, coddled. So uh, even though large flower daffodils are beautiful and they make great show flowers, they're not the best perennials for Texas. Usually what happens when you plant large flowered daffodils, if you think King Alfred from the old days, although they're much more modern cultivars now that are, that are commonly sold, what happens after three or four years, uh, and even in East Texas where they tend to grow better, five or six or eight years, they eventually make foliage and no flowers. And then you have to go through and dig them all up, separate them, fertilize, improve the soil. Well, I can tell you as a gardener, I'm not fixing to do that. And so if it's not a long-term perennial that not only lives as a plant, but continues to flower each year, uh, I'm not gonna grow them. So be careful when choosing great big showy flower daffodils because most of the time 
you're going to get foliage long term and not flowers, which would be fine if you're a cabbage or a collard, but as a daffodil, we want flowers. And so people often ask me, well, how many years does it have to perform well before you say it's truly adapted to the south? Well, my general rule is I want it to grow at least 20 years without needing to be divided and preferably 200. And so I, when I plant a bulb in the ground, I want it to get better every year of my life and preferably after my life. And so planting bulbs that are short-term annuals and that either have to be replanted or constantly dug up and divided are not something that particularly interests me. Maybe when I was younger and stronger, but after multiple surgeries and hip replacements and all that sort of thing, once I get them in the ground, I want them to stay in the ground. Luckily, as I mentioned, there are some that do extremely well. So if you choose properly, if you listen to what I'm going to teach you, if you read the, the right books, if you visit the right gardens, you too uh, can have spectacular scenes that might look like Holland, uh, might look like the Northeast, might look like Martha Stewart's landscape. But I can tell you they're probably going to be different bulbs in what they're growing, or they're just going to be a few of the things that they have, uh, knowing that the majority of them aren't going to work well here. That's a scene from uh, Louisiana, uh, about the same latitude as us in East Texas, so uh, all of those do well for us too. Okay, let's start off with the daffodils that are in the sale. Uh, first one I'm going to mention, and we're going to roughly go through these in alphabetical order, starting with daffodils and then going on to jonquils and then the narcissus. So Barrett Browning is a white daffodil uh, with an orange cup, uh, long-term perennial blue-gray foliage, uh, certainly going to do well, uh, particularly in, in East Texas. Be careful if you live in the alkaline, drier parts of Texas. So once you get to I-35 and the uh, limestone soil and the high pH, uh, the daffodils and the jonquils don't do so well, uh, but the narcissus do. And so when we're talking about daffodils, particularly the showy ones, uh, tend to do better in, in East Texas and all to the east, uh, but not so well as you head, head west across Texas. So Barrett, Barrett Browning is certainly a beautiful one. And there you see it in our inner bulb trials with the white petals and the orange cups. Bittern is a fairly recent addition to our sale that's done well in our trials. You can see it has multiple flowers, uh, pale yellow petals, uh, smaller flowers, and an orange yellow cup. Uh, some uh, Narcissus and Jonquil parentage in this one. And here you see it after three or four years and how it's multiplied well. I wish you could see the entire trial because I'd say about 85% of the things are dead. And so I've been trialing bulbs my entire life and I would say we're looking at probably 85 to 90%. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds, uh, well over three or 400 different uh, uh, daffodils, narcissus, and jonquils that I've trialed, uh, most of them that no longer exist. So we're talking about uh, only about a dozen or so uh, of the things that they sell from Holland that do well for us. And bittern is certainly one of those. Here you see it increasing well and lots of blue. Carlton is one of the most popular daffodils in the world, about the closest thing you can get to a, to a large flowered daffodil. Uh, that does well as a perennial. Even it's probably going to need to divide in about every 10 or, 10 or 12 years. But here you see with the, the, the somewhat uh, lemon yellow flowers, uh, fairly large cups, the, the typical blue gray foliage of a, of a daffodil. And here's my friend Frank Wagner and, and his dog Cassie in Jacksonville, Texas. After his wife passed away, he dug up her daffodils from the yard, started planting them in the pasture, and you can see they've done ex extremely well. So that's Carlton, uh, one of the most popular landscaping and quote naturalizing daffodils in the world, although it doesn't set any seed. So those all got there because Mr. Wagner planted a bulb in each one of those clumps. Ceylon is one that we've been selling for a few years now. Uh, a large flowered daffodil that has bright yellow petals and bright orange cups. Uh, if you looked at it, you would think that's not a daffodil that would do well uh, in East Texas, but it has performed well. And so that's in the cell, and there you see it in the in the trial beds. Where you see that blank space in the background, uh, those are daffodils that have died and, and disappeared. Uh, just to let you know, it's pretty easy uh, to tell a, a good daffodil from a from a bad daffodil if one's pretty and one's dead. So that's Ceylon. Elvin's voice is a fairly recent addition. Uh, beautiful white uh, flowers, somewhat ruffled. Uh, once again, looks like one that doesn't do well. Uh, it's one that's American bred, uh, came from the eastern United States, so that makes it more adapted, of course, uh, to eastern Texas. So that's Elvin's voice, uh, beautiful. And there you see it once again in the, in the trial. This is actually in 2021 after it got zero degrees, and so 
a lot of the more tender types, a lot of the, uh, all the Tazettas froze, all the Narcissus froze, uh, Jonquils took it on the chin. Uh, some of the daffodils, as you can see behind it there, that's Optum, which is a good variety, got some burn, uh, but Eldon's voice uh, came on and, and did fine. So daffodils, as a rule, are from Europe and from a colder climate, so they tend to have less problem with cold than, say, Mediterranean bulbs like Jonquils and Narcissus. So uh, really quite unusual that year to have anything looking good, but it, it certainly February Gold is, is a quite popular early bloomer, uh, hence the name February Gold. Uh, it's actually a cyclamenous hybrid, which gives it those swept back petals, a uh, long yellow trumpet there, so it's one that I can never have enough of. Uh, there you see them planted in my mom's front pasture, and you see those nice clumps and multiple flowers on there, so it's February Gold. Ice Follies, probably uh, either equal or second most popular uh, naturalizing or, or landscaping daffodil in the world up there with, with Carlton. I think those two are probably the most sold daffodils in the world. If you looked at it, you would think uh, it's too large and showy to be a good perennial for Texas, but Ice Follies is a proven performer, uh, even in the Dallas area. Uh, it's unique because it starts off with white petals and bright lemon yellow uh, cups, and then those cups eventually fade to white, so it gives you that bicolor look, all shades between white and yellow. I love to have some whites and, and uh, primrose yellows. Uh, since there are so many of these species and cultivars that are bright yellow, it gives us uh, some related colors and makes a uh, more of a Monet uh, look out there in the And there you see some ice follies in my own landscape. Uh, it's such a, such a pretty one and such an easy one to grow and such a showy one. Uh, I like to mix it in everywhere I, where I can, ice follies. Jetfire is a small flowered daffodil. Uh, also a cyclamenous hybrid with those swept back petals. Uh, has a long trumpet that sticks out there uh, that looks kind of uh, almost red orange when it first opens up. So uh, golden yellow petals and an orange cup on jet fire. Obdum is another one that uh, I wouldn't have thought did well, but from the very first year in the trials, I could tell it was, it was a good performer each year. Multiplied well, made more and more blooms. And then finally, when I got to studying it, it turns out it's the double sport of ice follies. And so it's the same plant as ice follies, just has a lot more petals. So that explains why it does so well. So that's obdum. Uh, now, like all double daffodils, if you get a lot of rain or, or wind, uh, they might fall over. Uh, typical year, they're gonna stand up, make great cut flowers. All double flowers tend to last longer than single flowers. Uh, but it has those same colors that you get in ice follies, uh, just mixed in multiple petals, uh, fully double. And it's also stable in the, uh, in the past, there were some double sports of ice follies uh, that didn't stay uh, true. In other words, sometimes they'd be single, sometimes they'd be semi-double, sometimes they'd be fully double. Well, Optum is a fully double sport of ice follies, so a really good one, and I'm excited to plant more and more of it. St. Kevin is actually uh, about as close you can get as to a, a King Alfred-type large flowered golden yellow daffodil. And so once again, it's probably going to need the division about every 10 or 12 years. But if you want a really big, showy yellow daffodil that has proven to be a, a good performer across the South, uh, St. Kevin uh, would be a good choice. Smiling Twin is an American bred hybrid. Uh, has a couple of flowers per stalk, uh, white petals and bright yellow uh, cups uh, that are actually spread out across the petal, almost a papillionaceous type with a, with a split coronas on there. So that's Smiling Twin, uh, an American bred, smaller flowered, bicolored daffodil. And here you see them in, in a landscape. Uh, once again, I like those bicolors because it tends to tie the whites and, and the yellows together when you're doing mass plantings or planting multiple uh, cultivars together. Starlight Sensation, another fairly recent addition to our sale that's done well in the trials. You can see it has multiple flowers per stalk, probably belongs in the Narcissus Tazetta group. Uh, white petals, white cups, uh, sort of a nodding uh, flower, probably has triandrous blood in there, the, what they call the angel wing um, or angel tears, uh, Narcissus. Tahiti is a large flowered, really showy double. Uh, first time I saw this, I thought, no way it's going to be a perennial here. It's done pretty well, and so we introduced it for experimental purposes a couple of years ago. I'm still waiting to see if it's going to live to be my 20 or 200 years. Uh, but if you want to play with something that's really showy, bicolor orange and yellow petals, Tahiti it is a, a really fun double daffodil. The next group we're going to look at are jonquils. Uh, jonquils are those 
Narcissus that go back to the species Narcissus jonquilla, uh, which was actually a, a corruption of the Latin name uh, meaning uh, the rush flowered uh, Narcissus. And so uh, the rushes are in the genus Juncus. And if you'll notice the foliage in a jonquil looks a lot like bulrushes. Uh, they're characterized by small yellow flowers, a powerful sweet fragrance, and round dark green foliage. So that's the straight wild jonquil that you see there from Spain and, and France. Uh, the ones that we have in the sale this year, uh, Narcissus fernandesii, which essentially just likes, looks like the naturalized uh, quote wild jonquil that you'd see at old home places in Texas. Uh, round stems, uh, delicate bright yellow, uh, mid-season bloom flowers, but uh, as close as you can get uh, right now commercially uh, to our naturalized wild jon jonquil, Narcissus fernandesii. And I love jonquils. As soon as I see or smell the first jonquil, uh, generally around February, uh, that tells me springtime. Um, and there you see how they've done well in the trial. They multiplied well. Flowers stand up about a, about a foot high with a little round, a typical jonquil foliage. So just as cute as can be. And you can see what a, one of the common names in the South for jonquils were sweeties. Uh, one, because of the sweet smell, and two, because of the sweet look. We don't have any Campanile jonquils in the sale this year. Hopefully I'll get to dig some of those within the next couple of years and we'll offer those again. But we do have the double flowered Campanile. Uh, it doesn't make as many flowers as the traditional pass along Campanile, but as you can see, it has double petals. And the reason Campanile jonquils got the species name Odorous is they have that same sweet fragrance as the wild jonquil. So Narcissus Odorous Floriplena is a double Campanile. And this will be the first year we have those in the sale. I've been growing them now for 30 or 40 years, and I try to keep them mixed in here and there just for a surprise in my naturalized plantings. This is a really, really fun one. Uh, I call it the dwarf jonquil. It's sold in the trade as Narcissus wacomii, and it's essentially a miniature jonquil. So it gets about six inches tall, the same little round uh, jonquil foliage, same fragrance as a jonquil, but it's about the cutest thing you'll ever see. Uh, I've never been as smitten with a uh, with a bulb in the trial. Maybe Optum when I first noticed it was doing well, but this thing is so darn cute. Uh, I don't think I could have a, enough of it. So that's Narcissus wilcomia, a little dwarf. And you see how well it's performed. Literally looks like clumps of grass with lots and lots of little jonquil flowers in there. And so uh, early mid-season bloomer, Narcissus wilcomia. Golden Echo is another uh, American red jonquil. It's unique because it has yellow cups and white petals, but notice how the color of the cup bleeds into those petals. So extremely um, bicolored in its uh, appearance with the white and yellow. And once again, a great tie-in for, for yellow flowers and, and white flowers, particularly tie in Narcissus into daffodils. So that's Golden Echo, uh, one of the American red jonquil hybrids that's done well in our Awera is an older cultivar, sort of a primrose yellow. Uh, another uh, uh, jonquil crossed with an, uh, some other species, and you see it has sort of that um, uh, triandrous look with the, with the nodding flowers. Uh, once again, I like those that have a, a primrose or pale yellow color because it ties those whites uh, into the yellow. So that's Hoera. Kedron is a unique jonquil hybrid, and this picture doesn't do it justice because it literally is bronzy flowered. So it's not just orange colored, it's odd. It's the oddest colored uh, daffodil or jonquil I think I've ever seen. And so depending on when you catch it, when it first opens up, it literally will be somewhere between apricot and bronze and peach and orange uh, with the lighter colored petals. So that's Kedron, another one that's done well for me. Pippet, uh, somewhat older color cultivar, also bred in America, I believe, also bicolored with the yellow petals and the white cup. And you see how the white cup bleeds uh, into the petals, giving you that bicolored appearance. So Pippet does extremely well, a good jonquil hybrid, uh, particularly uh, for East Texas and East. And there you see some really pretty clumps of it uh, growing in a woodland setting. I say woodland setting, realize that all the things I've showed you want winter sunlight. And so you can grow them in the woods or in the shade if they're deciduous trees. So you don't want to plant daffodils and jonquils and narcissus under any evergreen tree because they're not going to be enough sunlight for the foliage. So think of foliage on a, on a bulb as a solar panel, and it's out during the winter time, and you have to have winter sunlight. No such thing as too much sun. So first preference is full sun. Second preference 
would be deciduous shade, but you'd never want to plant them under evergreen shade. Sweet Love, another American bred hybrid, uh, bicolor with white petals and an apricot center, so also a unique color. Uh, Sweet Love, one of the jonquil hybrids that once again has performed well in our trials. It's uh, pretty obvious uh, after trialing a bunch of these plants that realize if they're bred in the eastern United States, uh, they tend to do well for us here. If they're bred in Europe, oftentimes if they, they don't, and a lot of those that are bred in the Northwest haven't done so well, but a lot of it has to do with parentage. So jonquil hybrids tend to do well, dappled dill hybrids not so much. Sweetness is one of the best, easiest performers you can grow. It, it, it's kind of a, a modern version of a Campanile jonquil. Bred to be a cut flower, generally has about two flowers per stem, really good substance, bright yellow, nice fragrance, uh, actually a cross between a, a daffodil and a jonquil. So sweetness is one that I can't live without. Matter of fact, sweetness at every entrance uh, to any place that I have. So if there's a pasture and a home place or some place I like to visit, I plant sweetness right there at the gate when I'm driving in uh, so I can see them. A really good one to have, sweetness. Multiplies prolifically and blooms well year after year. You can look at that foliage and tell the, the daffodil parentage in there with the wider blue-gray look. But you see it's somewhat rounded and it picks that up from the, from the jonquil parentage. The third group we're going to look at uh, in the genus Narcissus, we're actually going to call the common name Narcissus. And so things that I refer to as Narcissus descend from Narcissus tazetta, which is a Mediterranean plant. Uh, they're more tender, uh, tend to do better the closer you get to the Gulf Coast. They don't do well in the northern United States. They don't do well in Europe. They don't do well in Holland. As a matter of fact, when you buy uh, Narcissus tazetta in cultivars out of a Dutch bulb catalog, often those things are, are grown in Israel, which actually more mimics a Texas climate than Holland does. And so characteristics of Narcissus are that they have clusters of mostly white flowers, a few yellows, a few creams, mostly different shades of white and cream, really small cups. Matter of fact, the, the Latin name Tazetta uh, literally means uh, little cup. And they have a powerful fragrance, an obnoxious fragrance to some. So it's so overpowering that some people don't like the fragrance of Narcissus. I actually do. Uh, they bloom so early, there's not a lot of other things to out there to, to, to smell. So I'm perfectly happy with the fragrance. My grandmother, Amanis, wouldn't let me bring any of those things, any of those stinking flowers in the house, she would say. I mostly have dark green, wide dark green foliage, and they tend to be more adapted, even though they're equally adapted to acidic soils, uh, they tend to be adapted to alkaline soils uh, in areas like Dallas, Austin, San Antonio. Those that we have in the cell, first of all, is going to be ABBA. Uh, ABBA is a double flowered sport of Cragford. Cragford is an old Tazetta that does well that has white petals and orange cups. And here you can see the double version of that. Uh, been grown in Southern Gardens for, for years now. Also does, does well in the trial, of course. So that's ABBA, a double flowered sport of, of Cragford. Early Cheer is one that does extremely well. Has very double flowers. Uh, it's purportedly the double sport of Grand Primo, which I'll talk about here in a minute. So Grand Primo does extremely well. So of course the double flowered sport does well. Uh, two, just realize if it comes a freeze or a snow or a heavy rain, those double flowers might flop over. And so if you know a bad storm is coming, you're going to want, gonna, uh, want to go out there and pick those flowers uh, and use them as a, as a bouquet. And they dry wonderfully too. So double flowers, remember, last longer as cut flowers and dry better as it's cut flowers. So that's early cheer. Uh, a double flowered Narcissus. You see them uh, being used as a cut flower in, in the house. Uh, creamy yellow flowers, powerful fragrance. Falconette is one of the, the yellow uh, Narcissus hybrids, has orange cups, yellow petals. So yellow is somewhat unusual in the uh, Narcissus world and certainly orange cups are even more rare because all the orange cups that you see in daffodils and Narcissus come out of a tiny little red ring uh, on a yellow cup uh, of the poet's Narcissus. And so through years and years of breeding, they took that tiny red ring and eventually did uh, bred orange cups uh, in Narcissus and, and daffodils and jonquils too, for that matter. So that's falconet, a good person. Geranium essentially looks like Cragford, Cragford but blooms later, uh, white petals and, and orange cups, a good performer for the South, particularly if you like to extend the blooming season flowered sport of that, excuse me, uh, the double flowered sport uh, that we'll get to in a minute is Sir Winston Churchill. But since we're going in alphabetical order, let's look at Grand Primo next. 
Grand Primo is a several hundred year old cultivar, uh, not sold in the Dutch trade, but extremely common throughout the South. Matter of fact, the most common Narcissus in Texas and the South. Multiplies profusely, blooms year after year, never needs digging, never needs dividing. So these are ones that I actually uh, started with as a kid. I started with five bulbs uh, and eventually made a patch. And so the Grand Primo bulbs that were selling in the sale are ones that I grew and, and dug myself. And so there is no tougher, longer lived, more proven performer in Texas than Grand Primo Narcissus. So uh, white petals, uh, pale yellow cups that fade to white, powerful fragrance, uh, wide blue gray foliage, but extremely tough and extremely. When I say tough, when I was the county horticulturist years ago in Cherokee County, a retired school teacher called me and said, come look at my driveway. And I said, I'm too busy to look. She was a teacher. So she said, you get over here right now. She had forgotten when she put a new asphalt driveway down that she had Grand Primo Narcissus planted there. And the next spring, the Grand Primo Narcissus bloomed through the asphalt driveway. So that's the kind of toughness we're talking about. Uh, but pretty as can be, but tough as a boot. So Winston Churchill, I mentioned, uh, it's actually uh, the double flowered sport of geranium. So same bloom time, same flower color, but extra petals. So Sir Winston Churchill is a prolific uh, later flowered, matter of fact, one of the later bloomers for us, uh, the double flowered uh, version of geranium. Thalia is an older cultivar, uh, beautiful white, delicate petals on a, on a tough plant, uh, has good fragrance, has good substance, and a good long-term perennial. So that's Thalia. Uh, and there's the beautiful bed of them, Thalia narcissus. Now, just to show you uh, what I like to do with these plants, uh, you can certainly grow them in flower beds, you can certainly grow them uh, on fence rows, you can grow them around trees, you can grow them in mixed borders, uh, you can grow them as pocket perennials in flower beds. Uh, what I like to do, just because I tend to work all the time, uh, don't have a whole lot of time to garden, if I have open meadows, uh, I try to plant lots and lots and lots of daffodils and jonquils and narcissus. And because they don't need water and they don't need fertilizer and they don't need dividing and they don't need spraying and they don't need coddling and primping and, and, and pruning or whatever uh, other plants tend to need in the garden, it means I can put them out there, have something pretty to look at. And as long as uh, they don't have the foliage mowed down uh, before Mother's Day, they're going to come back year after year after year. So I want to see I want to show you the, uh, the four examples that, that I grow. Each one of them is about an acre in size. So this is a front acre in front of my parents' house. As you see, mostly heirloom uh, types. That's actually a red clay hill, uh, uh, iron ore, gravel, and red clay. And so a really tough spot to grow any plants. And because these plants are so tough, even though it's not the ideal spot, they make a, a nice performance every year. Been growing them there for about 30 years. And long after both my parents and myself are gone, uh, they'll still be doing well and multiplying. Way back in the, in the middle there, you can see some uh, dark green foliage. There was an old home place there and with some Texas star, uh, John Paul Narcissus Intermedius. And so I started with those and then started adding, adding each year. And my goal is to have a clump of bulbs every foot apart where you literally can't see the grass. So that's in front of my parents. Where my great grandparents lived, my paternal great-grandparents, I took all, uh, my great-grandmother, Big Mama, I took all of her bulbs in the yard, took them out back, so when somebody was hired to mow, they wouldn't be mowing the foliage down. And I just keep multiplying and multiplying, mostly old, old uh, cultivars that she had there, so I don't add anything new there. I just take what she had and keep multiplying them. So it makes quite a scene each year. And then I have an old house that I call uh, Miss Lou's because Miss Lou Wheeler lived there. She had one row of jonquils, one row of, of butter and eggs, daffodils, and one row of Texas star uh, jonquils. And so this is where I, I put my uh, new introduction, things that were trialing and testing. I don't have any stipulation there, uh, except I want it to be perennial. And so it may be a daffodil, maybe a narcissus, maybe a jonquil, maybe new, maybe old. And then I, uh, after they finish blooming, after the foliage goes dormant, uh, around Mother's Day, uh, that's when I mow them down, and then I just keep it mowed as a lawn after that. And last but not least is where I live. Uh, I have about an acre out front uh, where I do mostly heirloom species. It was my grandparents' house, my great-great-grandparents' house, so I try to grow older cultivars there just because they fit in the old community there. 
And in, once again, long-term uh, perennials, things that no, don't need digging and divide. I say don't need digging. I literally go out there and dig them up in full bloom each year, and that's when I do my multiplying. The worst thing that can happen when you divide them in full bloom is they miss the next year's bloom. But for something that's going to bloom the rest of, your, of my life, uh, it's not that big a deal. And you can take an old clump, and there might be 20 or 30, or a really old clump. There might be 50 or 60 bulbs in that clump. It allows me to go out there and spread them and make more and more and give it that naturalized look. So just wanted to let you see, uh, in addition to growing them in flower beds, you can do mass plantings, mass naturalized plantings in parks and meadows and, and pastures. One of the beauties of doing uh, these particular bulbs, anything in the amaryllis family has toxic alkaloids in the foliage. And so when I plant them in pastures and you've got deer and cows and things that like to browse, they won't browse uh, anything in the genus Narcissus. So they may eat the grass down and they make one take one bite out of it, but it tastes bad and has mucilaginous sap in there. And so uh, it's a good plant to grow where you have a heavy uh, browsing from, from deer and cow and, and horses. A uh, little bit of instruction about uh, when to plant these things and how to plant these things. I already told you, plant them in the most sun that you have. Full sun is preferable. Uh, direct light is, is fine, and if you're going to put them under any trees, make sure uh, that those trees are deciduous trees and you don't have too much shade, and certainly avoid anything that has evergreen foliage. These are bulbs that go dormant during the summertime when it's dry, and as soon as we get the fall rains, that's when they start to grow. And so we've already had our first rains of fall, even though we're still in a drought right now, so they've already started making root growth. So as soon as you purchase these bulbs, you take them home and plant them immediately. Uh, because you're already a little bit behind. You tend to want to have them in the ground by the 1st of October each year, uh, preferably even before, because when the oxblood lilies bloom and the spider lilies bloom, that tells you when the root growth starts on daffodils and narcissus and jonquil. So plant them just as soon as you can. Uh, keep them dry and room temperature until you get them planted, but plant them literally as soon as you can. Don't have to water them in because uh, we typically have wet uh, or moist winters uh, in, in Texas, and so other than 2011, where it barely rained during the winter time, uh, they, they lack a moist winter and a dry summer. And please, please do not braid the foliage, do not tie up the foliage, do not put rubber bands around the foliage. I know the foliage isn't so attractive when the flowers finish blooming, but it's this year's foliage that gives you next year's flowers. So if you picture those those leaves right there as solar panels, and if I went out there and tied your solar panel in a knot, it's not going to make much electricity, and so you have to have the foliage. Every leaf on every plant, whether it be a narcissus or a shrub or a tree, is directly oriented to the sun uh, to catch those rays of sun, to produce chlorophyll, produce carbohydrates, and they store up that energy in the bulb to make next year's flower. So tolerate the foliage uh, at least until Mother's Day, preferably even Memorial Day, and after that they go dormant, and you can mow it, mulch it, do anything you want. So once the foliage turns yellow, or certainly by the time it turns brown, yeah, you can cut it off. But don't cut it off while it's green, and don't tie it up because you're doing the plant harm. And if you do that every year for five or ten years, the bulb's actually going to die because it has to have that foliage storing up energy, and it gets that energy from the sunlight. Let's look at some other spring blooming bulbs that are in the sale. Uh, we've got multiplying onions. These things used to be common in, in feed stores and in the country. Uh, these are evergreen perennial onions uh, that are grown for using as green onions, not for bulbs, but using the foliage as onions. They're actually quite showy in flower, as you can see here in, in my backyard. And so they call them gumbo onions because they tend to be used as green onions uh, for gumbo. Another Cajun cook, and I'm married to a Cajun, and so she can't live without parsley and green onions for cooking just about anything. So if you want an easy to grow uh, perennial long-term onion, you plant these things, and then they multiply. And then you dig them up during the summertime, you can pull them apart. One clump turns into a bunch of clumps. So one, literally one bulb turns into a whole clump of bulbs in, in a single season's growth. So you can leave them in the ground. The foliage gets smaller each year. But if you want to make uh, more plants, you dig them up. You can literally put them in a basket or a paper bag all through the summertime. As long as you get them back in the ground, about September, October, they make foliage all winter, bloom in the springtime, go dormant in the summer. So the same growth cycle as the daffodils and the jonquils. And this is... They've also got African hosta, which is not a true hosta, but a Dremiopsis. Really beautiful perennial for either containers or, or beds. It'll tolerate shade, has variegated foliage, and somewhat attractive flowers. So uh, it's something that uh, we have in the sale. Generally each year does extremely well in our botanical garden here. We generally get these from a former uh, county of horticulturist here, Keith Hansen. So that's
pasta. We've got a, a limited number of Byzantine gladiolus, one of my favorite bulbs in the world, technically a corm, a modified stem, as opposed to a modified uh, leaf. Uh, gladiolus byzantinus is actually an old, old uh, species uh, from the Mediterranean, has screaming magenta flowers. It's another one that started with five corms as a kid, eventually built up a block of 10,000, so it multiplies profusely, wants full sun, good drainage, no such thing as, as too much sun, and it's perfectly happy in sand, silt, or clay, East Texas, Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, doesn't care, just a really long-lived, pruned performer that multiplies prolifically, blooms each year without having to be staked, so it's the best long-term uh, perennial gladiolus that we can grow. Now be careful, because if you pick up a Dutch catalog, they'll offer something in that, that, that they call a gladiolus communis byzantinus and give you the impression that it's the same as the Byzantine gladiolus that we grow in the south. But if you see those pale little pink flowers in the right there, that's what you get when you buy a Byzantine gladiolus from a Dutch bulb catalog. Uh, nothing at all like the plant that we grow is Byzantine gladiolus. In fact, here's what the foliage and the flowers look like on some old clumps of what you buy from, from Holland. Makes a lot of foliage, hardly any blooms at all, flops around, not even the same plant. So if you see cheap Byzantine gladiolus out there, unfortunately that's what you're going to get. Uh, the true heirloom, southern, uh, southern heirloom Byzantine gladiolus isn't available in the commercial trade. So it's only if you select sales like this or trading with your garden and friends that you're going to get the real McCoy. We've got uh, Spanish bluebells or wood hyacinths in the sale. Uh, the wild form is, tends to be blue or, or pale blue, so it's actually the strongest grower. Uh, we offer a cultivar called Excelsior, uh, a good hyacinth look-alike, particularly for, uh, for deciduous shade, for shade gardens. Here you see my late uh, uh, friend Mary Beth Haygood's garden in Nacogdoches, Texas, and you see how prolific they are uh, blooming in the springtime with the azaleas. We've also got uh, pink ones and white ones for sale. They're not as strong a growers as the blue, but if you'd like a mixed color uh, to give you a combination and you might want to get some pink ones and white ones to add with your blues. So those are wood hyacinths or Spanish. Also got the uh, spring star flowers in the sale. A really really easy to grow plant. Has foliage that smells like garlic and uh, flowers that smell like freesia. So that the common form uh, this is actually a plant from, from Argentina, from South America. It has uh, light blue flowers. Uh, there are darker blue flowers and white ones and pink ones available. This is a blue flowered form, particularly the light blue flowered form uh, that does the best. And here you see uh, a whole lawn full of them in the Isaiah district in Tyler, Texas. Actually, the Brook Streets district, if I remember correctly. So that's spring star flower, Ithion uniflorum. One of the easiest and most adapted bulbs that you can grow in, in Texas is going to be the summer snowflake, which doesn't bloom in the summer but blooms in the springtime, Lycogium estivum. Now, this is a plant that will grow in full sun, full shade, wet soil, dry soil, acid soil, alkaline soil, will grow in the lawn, the flower bed, or the ground cover, or the pasture. So it's just an amazing plant. Little white bell-shaped flowers with green spots on there. Uh, we've got the standard form with somewhat smaller flowers, the, the typical snowflake. They've also got a, a selection called Grave Tide Giant, which has somewhat larger flowers and blooms a few weeks later if you'd like to extend the season. So both of them outstanding plants for all of Texas and the South. Snowflakes. Not to be confused with snowdrops, even though there are people that call these snowdrops and snowbells and dewdrops. If you pick up a Dutch bulb catalog and order a snowdrop, you're going to get a plant that won't even live one year in Texas much less for the rest of your life. So you want to make sure you plant true snowflakes or lycogium. You see my uh, my boy Acer admiring a stand up at my farm. Snowflakes. We've also got hardy white gloxenias, which aren't a true gloxenia. Uh, a prolific uh, multiplier, uh, mid-spring flowers with these long white trumpets on there, uh, gray-green foliage growing semi-shade or full sun, easy, easy to grow, makes a tuber under the ground that looks like somewhat like a, a baking potato. So that's the hardy white gloxenia we produce ours ourselves. Some other summer blooming uh, bulbs and other plants that are going to be in the sale. Uh, one would be the achimenes. There's only one achimene that, that does well in the south, also known as the uh, orchid pansy. It's the heirloom strain with the purple flowers, the same one that my uh, late piano teacher, Lynette Yancey, grew in, uh, in pots in Longview, Texas, and I fell in love with as a kid. Uh, thankfully, Keith Hansen produces these for us. And so what you're going to get 
or some little rhizomes and then you're going to plant them uh, in pots or in the ground or you could even hold them in a bag until springtime but you got to be careful because they'll actually start to sprout in the and this is what you're going to get they're going to look like little purplish pink pine cones be very careful with them because they're very delicate and it's very easy to break them and have them fall all the pieces so those are achimenes uh, a cherished pass along plant particularly for for shady landscapes and containers and even sometimes as a bedding plant uh, achimenes or orchid pansies this is the only one in my experience that, that, that does well. We have voodoo lilies or Morphophallus bulbifera, really odd looking flower. Uh, pop mid spring. Uh, the foliage uh, looks like a little palm tree standing there, so a good plant for good drainage and, and shade gardens. And it actually makes these little bulbils on top of the plant, and those are what we sell uh, in the sale. Once again, these are produced by our, our former county horticulturist here, Keith Hansen. Got one crinum in the sale this year. I love crinums. Uh, crinums are to the south what peonies are to the north. Big, bold, uh, pass along family heirloom perennials. And so the one we're offering this year uh, is one called Bradley. It was bred in Australia. I got it from Dr. Welch. Dr. Welch got it from bulb expert uh, Scott Ogden. And so it's more of a refined, if you're familiar with Ellen Boson Quip uh, that we have in the sale some years, it has smaller flowers, somewhat of a bicolor look to the flower. Garden. Uh, long, pretty, uh, tall standing stems, somewhat of a white center to the flower. So that's Bradley, and that'll be the only crinum that we'll have in the sale this year. Uh, that's assuming I get out there and, and hurry up and get them dug. So soil's pretty dry right now, and I don't like digging things when it's dry, but we'll have some nice fresh ones in the sale. Uh, the really beautiful uh, Australian bred crinum Bradley. My chickens like it too, you can see. Also going to have the old uh, pass along Crocosmia, Crocosmia flora, which is a, goes by the name of Montbretia. A really easy to grow iris relative. Uh, orange looks like a, a miniature gladiolus. Uh, one thing about Montbretia, uh, at least the old uh, uh, heirloom, this is the first hybrid Montbretia on the planet. It's still the best and the toughest and the easiest to grow. You don't want to give it too much water. You don't want to give it shade. You don't want to give it fertilizer. You want to keep it lean and mean to keep those plants standing up. And so if you're too nice to it, it's going to flop around. So uh, put it someplace. Uh, it's going to multiply prolifically. It almost multiplies as fast as nut sage, but has the beautiful orange flowers each summertime. We have hidden ginger in the cell, Curcumia petiolata, uh, has beautiful, uh, somewhat candle looking foliage. And then when the flowers appeared in the summertime, you have these beautiful uh, pink and white and yellow bicolored flowers uh, down in the foliage, hence the name hidden ginger. So some gardeners will actually go through there and cut off a bit of the foliage so you can see the flowers when they bloom. Others reach in there and cut the flowers, bring them in as cut flowers. So hidden ginger, a nice long lived perennial, uh, particularly for shaded gardens in Texas. We'll have the old-fashioned butterfly ginger, Hedicium coronarium, famous flowers that uh, they don't attract butterflies. As you can see, they look like butterflies. So they look like white butterflies. They smell like tropical Hawaii, uh, a good perennial uh, for shade. If you grow them in the sun, you want to grow them in moisture. So they're kind of like cannas and, and crinums that uh, uh, they just seem to be growing in sunny mud. So you can grow them in the shade or you can grow them in the sun if they have plenty of water. Beautiful fragrance. And there you see them in my uh, uh, late friend Mary Best Garden in, in Nacogdoches, Texas, perfuming the entire landscape. Hedicium coronarium or the butterfly ginger. Wonderful. This year we've got Hedicium coccinium, which would be rarely offered for sale uh, to anybody uh, without going through a special mail order catalog. So this is the orange ginger, uh, a summer bloomer, a spectacular bottle brush type flowers, and uh, start off kind of bright orange, fade somewhat to pale orange. A wonderful perennial that we produced ourselves here in the Idea Garden at the Tyler Botanical Gardens. It's the orange ginger or Hedicium coccinium, which actually means red, but as you can see, they're, they're more orange than, than red. But a beautiful, beautiful perennial. Uh, be limited in numbers, so they won't last long, but a, a wonderful new addition to the sale this year. This year we'll have the, uh, the double orange daylily known as Flora plena, Hemorocallus fulva Flora plena. Uh, typically, what we'd have would be the old thousand-year-old cultivar called Kwanzaa, which is more of a traditional tall uh, double orange daylily. Uh, Flora plena is an old cultivar that really is more triple flowered, has an extra set of petals in there, uh, not quite as tall, about half as tall as Kwanzaa, but an outstanding perennial. Matter of fact, I first got my start of these off the roadside uh, outside of Henderson, Texas. So uh, a sterile, long-lived, truly uh, heirloom pass-along 
uh, double orange daylily. Uh, they will view. Here you see them in my premium order. Just as pretty as, as can be uh, spectacular with all those petals. And the bicolor, uh, red orange and, and uh, medium orange and pale orange, all in the same flower. We'll once again have the tropical giant spider lily. Uh, so spider lily uh, is a common name used for the genus Hymenocallus, also a common name used for the genus Lycoris. So in the summertime, when we're talking about white flowers and summer plants, uh, we're talking about the genus, genus Hymenocallus. So Hymenocallus carabia, tropical giant, blooms about July 4th with fireworks of white, fragrant, spectacular flowers, uh, delicate flowers, last two or three weeks in big, big fold, showy clumps of foliage. Uh, all through the summertime, go dormant during the wintertime. So equally adapted to uh, acid soils as well as alkaline soils, the tropical giant spider lily. Big, bold, long-lived perennial for Texas in the south. Now let's look at some of the fall blooming bulbs that will be in the cell. Uh, I love fall blooming bulbs because, as we know, uh, drought in Texas can be a horrific thing. So when we get the first rains uh, of late summer headed into fall, this stimulates our fall blooming bulbs to bloom. It also stimulates, as I told you, the narcissus uh, bulbs to start root growth. So it literally is the change of our seasons uh, for the better, certainly, here in Texas. In the sale this year are all uniquely adapted to extreme drought. So if you're a fall bulb in Texas, that means you do not want any irrigation during the summertime and they actually do better during the summer drought. And so even though most other plants do poor, really poorly when it gets dry, just like this year, the narcissus, the jonquils, the daffodils, and all of the fall bulbs actually want to be dry during the summer. And the best blooms we ever get are when we have an historic drought and a historic hurricane that drops 10 or 15 inches of rainfall and they explode into bloom. So don't worry about drought the fall bulbs. Those in the cell are going to be cyclamen heterofolium, the hardy cyclamen. And notice the species name heterofolium is named after English ivy. You get these delicate little uh, flowers there. Uh, they're related to the, the florist cyclamen that you, might be, uh, that you might see sold at Christmas time. Uh, but these are fall bloomers, occasionally spring bloomers, uh, with much tinier flowers. But they're, they're true perennials with a great big underground tuber. The, the genus heterofolium comes from the fact that the variegated foliage literally looks a lot like English ivy. So that's the foliage during the wintertime I grown at the base of one of my post oak trees. Hybranthus tubospathus texensis, uh, one of our rain lilies, one of our native rain lilies known as the Texas copper lily. Delicate little flowers, uh, kind of an orangey yellow, native to Texas, skips over Mexico, and native again in South America, so an unusual distribution. And after each summertime, particularly late summer rain and early rain, they erupt into bloom uh, and then prolifically reseed. So it's a true naturalizer. You start with a few bulbs and they can reseed, and eventually you can have hundreds or even thousands of rain lilies. So that's the Texas copper lily. This year we'll have something different, uh, Zephyranthes uh, Grand Jacks. Grand Jacks is an, is an old hybrid rain lily. It's a cross, if you'll notice the name, uh, the cultivar name Grand Jacks is a cross between Zephyranthes Grandiflora and the old hybrid uh, Ajax, which was a cross of Zephyranthes uh, Candida and, uh, uh, hmm, Candida and, uh, Ajax, I've forgotten, a white, oh, uh, uh, cross between uh, Citrina and, and Grandiflora uh, gives you the, the combination of the, the yellow and the white and, and the pink. It's a spectacular, long-lived, sterile, doesn't set any seed. Uh, I got these from Dr. Welch. He got them from Scott Ogden. Uh, I get, by the way, forget what I told you about the parentage there because I, I told you wrong, uh, but it is a cross between Ajax and, and Grandiflora. And here you see Dr. Welch with his prolific borders of them. And so he, he let me dig some. Uh, I multiplied them. Then I let Keith Hansen have some. So Keith Hansen actually produced these for the sale. And that's one of the wonderful things about the Smith County Master Gardener bulb sale. We only grow things that we've trialed. We only grow things that we know grow in Texas. We only grow things that we know the parentage of. We only sell things that we know uh, the provenance of, who we got it from, the history, the parents, even though I can't always tell you the that parents because I can't remember it sometimes. But it's really wonderful to have these plants that have been passed along. If we got them from somebody that they knew that they grew well, and they got them from somebody that they knew that they grew well, and they were all from the U, and so we, you know that they're going to grow well for you. So that's the spectacular uh, Grand Jacks, the Zephyranthes there in, in Washington County, Texas. Those that we have for sale, the exact same clone are produced in Washington County, Texas. 
Once again, we'll have Lycoris radiata radiata, the old sterile uh, red spider lily. Been grown in the U.S. for hundreds of years. I've uh, been grown in Japan for longer than that. Originally native to China. Uh, tough as a boot. Easy. To here you see them growing at the house where my mom was born, so they once again are going to outlive you and your home. That house is gone, but I noticed those light chorus are blooming there this week. So that's the red spider lily, a uh, really good one. Uh, it blooms after the oxbud lilies, after school starts, after we get the first rains in the fall. Once again, we'll have light chorus LZE, a rare a peach colored spider lily. I got these from Cleo Barnwell, who got them, the late Cleo Barnwell of Shreveport. She got them from the late Sam Caldwell, my chorus breeder uh, from Nashville, uh, Tennessee. Uh, he got them from Japan. And so really good performer for us. They start off uh, by colors of peaches and uh, cream and, and pink and then turn almost white. Here you see them blooming along with my uh, oxblood lilies. Uh, growing out on the lawn, they'll also grow equally well in a flower bed. So that's Lycoris ilze, the peach spider lily. Don't have that many in the sale this year because I didn't get enough rain to bring them in, in the bloom, so I dug what I could. We'll also have Lycoris incarnata, the peppermint spider lily, an equally rare uh, hybrid that I got from Cleo, who got them from Sam Caldwell, who got them from Japan, uh, and they originally came from China as well. Uh, and actually uh, an old hybrid between uh, between a Lycoris longituba and Lycoris springer, I, I believe. So not something you're going to see at any other sale. Uh, once again, didn't get that many to dig this year because I not, never got enough rainfall to bring them into bloom. And there you see them growing out in my out in my lawn where I, where I dig them. So the peppermint spider lily, a sterile hybrid, Lycoris incarnata. Got a few Lycoris squamidra, what are known as naked ladies or resurrection lilies or surprise lilies. These are the most cold hardy of the Lycoris, so you tend to see these up as far north as even uh, Iowa and Michigan and, and Indiana. Um, once again, didn't get so many dug because it didn't get much rain to bring them into bloom. Great, great big flowers. Another old sterile hybrid uh, between uh, different species originally native to China. So it's a, it's a common pass along. Occasionally offered for sale in, in Dutch catalogs, but rarely offered to, uh, for sale in local sales. And once again, we'll have some red spider lilies uh, for sale, Rhodolphia bifida. Amazing plant adapted to East Texas, Central Texas, North Texas, South Texas, acid soil, alkaline soil, red clay, black clay, sand, silt. It will grow in the sun, it will grow in the shade, it will grow in the pasture, it will grow in your lawn, it will grow in your Asian jasmine, it will grow in the liripe, just an incredible plant. And it truly signals uh, the beginning of fall, it signals the beginning of school, uh, hence the name schoolhouse. And I started with a few of them, matter of fact, three bulbs years ago from Bryan, Texas, uh, some 30 something years ago when I went to school at Texas A&M and I eventually amassed a block of 10,000 as well. And so I'm not going to be happy till every inch of my ground is covered with, with red uh, oxblood lilies. Just a true proven performer, native of Argentina. But I've been told uh, by a bulb expert from Argentina that there are more oxblood lilies in Texas now than there are in Argentina. So that just tells you how well they do and how much we like to, to pass them around. The bulb this year is going to be a, a rare native hymenocallus uh, that, that I'll dig called Hymenocallus occidentalis eulae, beautiful white uh, ruffledy flower. It has the exact same growth habit as Lycoris squamidra, so it blooms on naked stems uh, late summer, anywhere from July to August, uh, occasionally as late as September. Fragrant flowers, but no leaves at all, goes dormant, and then the leaves appear during the springtime just like Lycoris squamidra does. So uh, a rare uh, native Hymenocallus uh, primarily just native to Texas and a little bit of the surrounding states. Uh, beautiful, unusual thing that we've got as a raffle plant. So if you want to buy a chance at that, uh, you can get a big, great big uh, fresh dug bulb that I'll provide. Uh, Hymenocallus occidentalis yule, or what Scott Ogden refers to as Hymenocallus galistinensis. Some of the seed that are in the sale this year, some pass along heirloom seed are going to be the bunny bloom larkspur. Uh, unfortunately, you can only buy double flowered larkspur, which actually tend to be shorter, but they're really tougher, easier to grow with form. 
uh, the single flowered form. And if you look real close, you'll notice that every one of them has a bunny rabbit in the flower and it blooms at Easter time. So what a great plant for children to grow. Simple to grow by scattering seed on bare soil during the fall time. Bloom in the spring, prolific reseeders, equally adapted to East Texas, West Texas, North Texas, Central Texas, acid soil or alkaline soil. Uh, the bunny bloom larkspur and one of the original uh, Texas superstar plants. Got some seed of uh, Cleo's purple coneflower, the same Cleo born well that shared her lycoris with me, also shared her purple coneflower with me. She loved antique roses, she loved bulbs, and she loved wildflowers. And so this is actually a Native American wildflower, and this is as prolific a, a strain as you can grow. Unfortunately, most of the really showy, uh, big flowered, um, multicolored uh, echinacea that you buy from from bulb cat I mean excuse me from perennial catalogs are not long lived perennials here much less reseeders this is a prolific reseeder it gives you lots of flowers lots of butterflies lots of pollinators and lots of volunteer seedlings so plant them in the springtime you can plant them in the fall if you want to and they'll they'll tend to reseed as well but most of them germinate uh, in the late winter early spring and can even bloom the first year from seed from year after that years and years after that you'll have multiple flowers and lots of volunteer seedlings if you let them go to seed. So that's Cleo's purple flower. And here you see some that I direct seeded into the Heritage Rose Garden at the Tyler Botanical Garden. And they actually were so prolific that we're having to remove them because they were choking out the roses. So that's, uh, this is that sort of the, uh, the heirloom bulb equivalent of a, of a native perennial wildflower that does so well that they'll actually choke out the, the weaker flowered plants. And it's pretty hard to choke out an antique rose, but these plants can do it. So Cleo's purple. Some years we offer bulbs, this year we're offering seed of the Lilium formosanum, the Philippine lily. The only lily that you can grow and bloom from seed in one year. It's actually a, a pretty long term perennial, but it's also a reseeder if you want naturalized lily bulbs. Here you see them in our idea garden at the Tyler Botanical Garden. Beautiful fragrant white flowers during the hottest part of summertime, pollinated by moths at night. Here you see uh, my own seedling streams where I've actually got them in my, uh, my pine savanna. Uh, I started with a few bulbs years ago uh, from a lady that shared them with me, Christine Langston in uh, Russ County, Texas. And now I let them reseed year after year. And even though the deer like to munch on them, I've got enough for the deer in me as well. So beautiful, fragrant lily, one of the true li lilies, one of the few true lilies that performs as a perennial and the only one that, would, that naturalizes in Texas. So that's the Philippine lily or Formosa lily. We've got some of my books for, for sale. So if you want an autographed book, a copy of the Heirloom Gardening or Texas Fruit and Vegetable Gardening or the Rose Rustlers, uh, those are available in the sale. Uh, actually, we've got the second edition of Texas Fruit and Vegetable Gardening uh, with some new plants added and new recipes, including those from my mom and my Cajun wife and myself. So that's Texas Fruit and Vegetable Gardening, uh, the revised and updated version. I also like to uh, uh, write uh, other articles as well. So if you don't want to get a copy of a book, check out my Greg Ramblings blog at arbogate.com where I post a monthly blog. Uh, of course, I write in Texas Gardener and have for about 30 years now every issue my In Greg's Garden column. I write every Sunday in the Tyler Morning Telegraph, a garden column. I've got a Facebook page uh, called Greg Grant Gardens where I'll repost my uh, garden columns from the, from the Tyler paper if you don't happen to get it. And also I've got a new Facebook page if you're a master naturalist and you like to follow along uh, with birds and bees and butterflies and that sort of thing. I've got my Rebel Eloy Amanda's Pine Savannah and Bird Sanctuary uh, Facebook page. If you want to learn more about bulbs, I highly encourage you to get a copy of Garden Bulbs from the South, for the South by a friend Scott Ogden, second edition. I believe that's a uh, uh, timber uh, press. So Garden Bulbs for the South will tell you all about spring bulbs, summer bulbs, and fall bulbs. Also, if you'll get a copy of Daffodils in Florida, a field guide to the coastal south. It covers most of the daffodils and jonquils and narcissus that do well uh, in the south, particularly East Texas and the rest of the south, but also all of Texas for that matter. So don't pay so much attention uh, to the fact that it's written in Florida. It's written in the Florida Panhandle, uh, but it's the best uh, daffodil book uh, for the uh, for South. Also, it's out of print, but if you can get a copy of Bulbs for Warm Climates from, by uh, the late uh, veterinarian and bulb expert Thad Howard, it was written in San Antonio. Uh, so he was quite the expert on all amaryllids in Texas. So a very good uh, source of information for Texas. 
as is our own uh, uh, Smith County's Chris Weisinger. He and my mentor, Dr. William C. Welch, teamed together to write the Bulb Hunter. So that's available from Texas A&M Press. We'll tell you all about the Southern Bulb Company, Chris Weisinger and his quest uh, to find uh, bulbs uh, uniquely adapted to Texas. Once again, uh, our goal isn't necessarily to sell you a bulb, but if you want to, uh, if you can't uh, access the bulb sale and you'd like good sources for, for Southern bulbs, uh, I like to think of myself as the Santa Claus and the Miracle on 34th Street. So some good sources for Southern bulbs. You have to be really careful because there are hundreds, if not thousands of sources for bulbs not adapted to the South. So pay particular attention to these and jot these down. Bulbmeister.com is a good source of bulbs and particularly unique like chorus, but lots of other bulbs as well. Edensblooms.com, good source of a, a like chorus, unusual things. Jinxfarmer.com, great source of uh, acronyms and other bulbs uh, out of South Carolina. Oldhousegardens.com is a Michigan, Michigan bulb company, but sells a lot of American produced bulbs, including those uh, adapted to both the North and the South. And each bulb listed there will tell you where it's produced, so pay particular attention to the those that are produced in Texas or Louisiana and the South. PlantDelights.com, a wonderful mail order perennial nursery out of North Carolina, carries a lot of uh, unusual lycoris and crinum lilies and rain lilies and lots of other bulbs uniquely adapted to the South. And then our own southernbulbs.com, located right here in East Texas, carries a lot of uh, heirloom bulbs adapted to the South, including spring bulbs fall bulbs and summer bulbs. So check out all those sources if there are things that you can't get in our sale here, or you're shopping at a different time, or you happen to be listening to this, and you can't make it to, to pick up the bulbs in, in Tyler, Texas. So really good sources of uniquely adapted. I want to say thank you to Ed McGee, uh, lifetime Smith County Master Gardener who founded this sale about a quarter of a century ago. It's still, still going strong, and if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be having this sale. A wonderful idea because he realized that most of the bulbs that people were buying weren't adapted to Texas and so he founded this sale to make sure people could get uh, those bulbs uniquely adapted here. Also thanks to the Smith County Master Gardeners, they spend thousands of man hours uh, putting this sale together, uh, coordinating the sale, digging bulbs, sorting bulbs, pricing bulbs, and of course thousands of dollars they put into the sale uh, and hopefully to make thousands of dollars to put into education uh, to the public here in Smith County and to the, uh, the Tyler Botanical Garden. I want to thank retired Smith County Horticulturist Keith Hansen uh, for PR for the sale and for bulbs that he provides for the sale. I want to thank friend Neil Sperry for providing PR to the sale. He also loves bulbs, uh, treasure to Texas horticulture. I want to thank Texas Gardener Magazine, Jay and Sally White for providing PR, also bulb lovers. And thank you to the Pollard United Methodist Church for allowing us to use the facilities uh, for not only uh, the bulb pickup, uh, but for an uh, educational program that I conduct there as well. So thank you, Pollard United Methodist Church. Thank you for uh, listening to the program. Hope you get to pr uh, purchase some bulbs, but if not, hope you learn something about bulbs and can check out the resources that I offered. That's the end of the 2022 uh, plant list uh, for the Smith County Master Gardener Bulbs to Bloom Conference in the Cell. Uh, this is Greg Grant. Hope to see you at the sale. If not, we'll see you again uh, with another presentation next year. Thank you.